Welcome to week five of our online academy. This week we're going to discuss a hands-on assessment process and we're going to look at critical measures as well. So I'm going to go through the theoretical uh, slides first and then that will be followed up with a practical demonstration. So let's get started. So the hands-on assessment process and I deliberately call it that because it's really vitally important that when you're assessing someone for a chair that you actually get your hands on the person that you just don't stand back and look you have to feel and palpate and we did discuss in, in previous uh, webinars about the pelvis and the important points and we'll cover that again when we're doing the practical demonstration so hands-on assessment is key so assessment is the key to the correct solution poor assessment equals a poor solution poor assessment also equals the progression of an existent deviant posture, the development of a new deviant posture, inefficient use of resources, and the cost to both the patient and your organisation. So we don't want you providing equipment and chairs that are not going to meet the client's need, because that is a cost not just to the patient, but to your organisation. So here are some general guidelines when we're starting off to do an assessment. So we talk about a holistic approach and considering the whole person. So you will remember back to week two where we talked about the goals of sitting and we talked about the physiological, the physical and also the psychological goals and the functional goals of sitting. So this is what we're talking about when we're saying the holistic approach, consider the whole person. You want to aim to fit the seat to the client not the client to the seat. So that's the advantage of having an adjustable and modular chairs, that you can fit the chair around the client's needs. Don't focus on the symptom, look at the cause. And again, you'll remember back when to week one, when we talked about the different postures and what causes these postures. So if someone's sitting, for example, in a posterior pelvic tilt, you don't want to just consider it's a posterior pelvic tilt. You have to look at the clinical reasons and also the reasons why, from a physical point of view, that the chair might be contributing to that posture. So don't just focus on the symptom. Look at the cause. And accept that there may be several right answers and it depends on preference and sometimes on finance. So selecting a chair can be a bit of um, a trial and error. Accept that seating will not solve everything and that's why it's so important to set your goals and managing expectation. And I always say find out what you as the assessor, what the client and the caregiver, what they need and then prioritise those goals. Accept that occasionally there may not be a solution. It's quite rare that we won't find a solution, but sometimes there may not be a solution. And accept that the best solution may not be ideal. We need to have buy-in from the user and the caregiver. So some other considerations. When we go to assess a client, the first thing you want to do, you want to observe them in their existing chair and try to identify what the problems are with their existing chair. And you'll, you'll know from the photographs that I've shown you of my case studies that we always look at the client from the front, the side and the back. You want to ask yourself, how long does the client sit for on a daily basis? Because that's going to indicate about pressure management, about function. So how long are they going to be sitting out in this chair on a daily basis? Look at their current seat and find out what, are the, what is the age of that seat? What condition is it in and what other chairs they've tried and what are the problems with the other chairs? So we want to identify the problems with their current seating and we ask the client and the caregiver for their input. Because if you don't get buy-in from the caregiver and the staff or the family, sometimes the equipment and the chair is not used correctly. And we need to look at skin integrity. And I always say, just don't ask. Always look to see what type of skin integrity is there. Have they a history of a pressure injury? Have they a current pressure injury? And always look at the skin and identify the need. 
So then we need to think about how the client transfers in and out of this chair. What type of lift do they use? Are they independent? Do they need the assistance of one or the assistance of two? And think also about the progression of the illness or the, dis the disability that the client has. Because if we're going to be assessing them now, we need to think about the long-term solution as well. Is the client still mobile and are they safe to mobilise? And how long is the client likely to maintain that mobility? How many transfers do they do per day? And what is their repositioning schedule? Because the chairs that we have, the Phoenix, the Sorrento, we are able to change their position using a handset. And that's really important. The caregiver can do that or the client in the chair can do that. So we need to identify how often the client needs to be repositioned every day. So we want then to look at the functional considerations, the activities that are undertaken in the chair. We should be considering participation in functional goals. So you want to think back to your goals of sitting and what you want to achieve for this patient. Do you want a power chair or a manual chair, depending on the needs of the care and on the cognitive ability of the person using the chair? And also safety should always be a high priority. So now that we have thought of the general considerations, I want to move on to the actual evaluation itself or the seating assessment. And this is usually conducted in three stages. So you have the person sitting in their existing chair, you have them in a supine position, and then we have them in an upright seated position. Now I want to also highlight, because I got a question this week, from an OT who is currently working in a care home because she's been redeployed because of the COVID-19. And what she's saying is she has no plinth. All the clients that she's assessing are on alternating air mattresses and she's finding it difficult to find a surface where she can actually do her assessment. So I'm going to cover that later because you can do an assessment of the critical measures in a seated position. And when we do our practical demonstration, I will answer that question for her. So people always say, well, where do you start? And that's a really important question. And we always start at the pelvis. So this is the structured order of assessment. And we talked earlier in earlier seminars about the importance of the pelvis and getting the pelvis right. Because the pelvis influences the position of the body above and below it. So getting the pelvis into the correct position is going to be key to good seating. So we always start with the pelvis. Then we look at the trunk, then we go on to the lower limbs, the upper limbs, and then the head and the neck. So in your head, you need to get a structure of how am I going to approach this? Part one of the assessment or the evaluation is going to be sitting in their current chair. Look at how the client presents in the chair. You don't try to correct at this stage. You're going to note their posture and we have an assessment form that you can use. And this assessment form can be downloaded from our website. So that's important that you use that assessment form. If you can get consent, it's really important to take photographs because that gives you so much more information. And also, when you're looking at the person in their current chair, consider the time of day because people change over the course of the time that they're sitting out. So the part two of the assessment is looking at the supine assessment. And I have covered this in a previous webinar. So you want to do it on a firm surface. It determines whether the, the deformities are correctable. You're looking for the available joint ranges as related to the seated person. Now, I'll discuss this later. So you're actually looking at hip movement. You're looking at range of movement at the knee. Those are two key critical measures. You want to think about, can a desired position be achieved without resistance? So we're going to start with the pelvis and the trunk. So you always start with the pelvis and you locate the ASIS and the PSIS. Now we've covered this in an earlier seminar. So if you want to recap, go back and see the location of the ASIS and the PSIS. So you're looking for pelvic obliquity, you're looking for a rotation, anterior pelvic tilt and posterior pelvic tilt. And the question you must ask yourself is, is it fixed? Is it partially correctable or is it flexible? because you know you have to accommodate a fixed posture and you want to try to correct a flexible posture. Then we're going to look at the trunk. We're going to look at scoliosis. Is it concave to the left 
or concave to the right? And is there a secondary scoliosis? We're going to look at lordosis, kyphosis and trunk rotation. And you also need to consider the shoulder uh, position and how much manipulation is needed to achieve a desired position. Now, this has been covered in an earlier webinar where I did the supine evaluation. So if you have any questions, if you want to go back to week three, this is covered in more detail. I will also recap on some of that later. Then we're going to look at the lower limbs and we're looking at hip flexion. And this is always with the knees bent. So I'm going to show you a little diagram here. So hip flexion with the knee bent. And when you over flex the hip, what happens is the hips begin to rotate. And when you look at this in sitting, this is giving the person a hip rotation. So don't over flex the hip. Secondly, we're going to look at knee flexion and extension. And the key here is that you must have the hip flex in order to test the knee flexion and extension. And it is going to um, determine where you put your foot plate and your leg rest. Now I'm going to show, I'm going to demonstrate later with my goniometer how to measure these angles. So I'll be doing that in a later demo. We want to also look at hip abduction and adduction. And we want to figure out is this fixed or is this flexible? And where do I have to set it in order to maintain a good posture in the chair? We're then going to look at the lower limbs with the hip and the knee flexed. So we're looking at angle, uh, angle uh, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. And the importance of this is you need to load the feet. 19% of the body weight goes through the feet. So loading the feet is really important. And on our chairs, we have the ability to accommodate plantar and dorsal flexion by adjusting the foot plate. So loading the feet is really important in seating. Then we go on to the head and neck. And you're looking at the neck and head from the side and also from the front view. So you're looking at the cervical curve. Is it neutral? Is it in flexion? Is it in extension or hyperextension? And is it fixed or is it correctable? And here, when I think of this, I always think of the Phoenix chair because the Phoenix chair has been designed to accommodate someone with hyperextension or with flexion and also to uh, support people who are in a very fixed position. So you want to then look at the neckline, the neck position. Is it in midline? Is it in lateral flexion? Or is there rotation of the, of the head? And again, is it fixed or is it correctable? And then we want to look at head control. Is it independent head control, full range of movement? Is there restricted head control or, or and is head control absent? And is it fixed or flexible? So that is in the supine evaluation. Then we want to look at part three is getting the person up into a seated position. Now, I would prefer on the edge of a plinth or on the edge of a bed, but I will demonstrate today how we can do that actually in a chair as well. So you want to observe their posture, their balance and their weight distribution. When the person is sitting on the edge of the bed or on the plinth, gravity is eliminated and we are actually getting to see the real posture. Is it independent or can they sit there without help? Do they need hands to hold on or are they fully dependent? And you're going to go through the same procedure as you do for the supine, starting with the pelvis. And you're looking for changes in tone. When you sit someone up in that seated position, does their tone increase? So what are the anatomical measurements that you need to uh, take? And here are some guidelines for taking measurements. Measure the client, not what you think the chair should be. Always use a firm surface and measure in the corrected position. So if you're able to correct the posture, you would measure in that position. Keep your tip straight, do not curve it around the client and always measure left and right sides and ask for assistance of another person because sometimes measuring can be difficult. The nice thing about the seating matters chairs is because they're so adjustable, you don't have to get the measurement exactly right because we can adjust the chair to accommodate the person when we have the person in the chair, which is really, really useful. So are they having an adjustable chair 
does take away that pressure to get the measurements exactly right. So what are the basic measurements in sitting? The essential dimensions. So the seat width. And the thing to remember, uh, as a therapist, as a young therapist, I always had this impression that seat width was the trochanter width. But you have to think about wind sweeping. You have to think about maybe abduction of the hip. So uh, the seat width, the widest part is not always the hips. You have to consider all fixed postures. The seat depth of your chair is vitally important because if the seat depth is too long, you're going to push the person into a posterior pelvic tilt. So I will demonstrate this when I'm doing the demo, how to measure seat depth. Foot rest angle and feet width. The angle of the foot rest is important because you need to load the feet and you need to ensure both feet are loaded. So the wider the chair, the wider the, cap, the foot plate will be in order to accommodate the feet. The back height and the back angle. Now the, angle the back angle of the chair is, a, is important to accommodate the hip angle. And I will demonstrate that later. And then armrest height is important because if you can get the armrest at the right height, you're given a nice midline position and you're going to avoid pelvic obliquity and rotation if the armrest is at the right height. So just to recap, what, what we want to do, we want to identify your top four goals for sitting. Write down what the client, the carer, and you as the assessor needs to achieve from this new seating system. Prioritize those goals, document your decision on the final product, and document any unmet need. So here we go now to the fitting process. So you've got your chair delivered and you're putting the patient in these are your uh, tick boxes that you need to ensure. So are the hips to the back of the chair? And is the angle of the back accommodating the hip angle? Are the legs in the best position? And is the seat height correct? Is the cushion given maximum support and pressure redistribution? And always check the skin for redness. So if I leave a chair with someone, I always ensure that after two hours, someone checks their skin to ensure because this is a new posture, it's a new chair for them and we want to ensure that we're not causing any damage. So you always check the skin for redness after about two hours in the chair or maybe if they're very vulnerable, high risk, maybe after one hour in the chair. Ask yourself, is function optimised? Is the client comfortable? And have you maximised the contact with the chair? You'll remember that that is one of my key things for seating, is to get as much of the body in contact with the chair as possible. So I'm going to look to see, is the head supported? Is the back fully supported? Is the thigh supported? Are the feet loaded? And are the arms loaded? So have the body maximise contact with the chair. So we're going to get into a summary now. And the summary uh, is to be take before and after photographs. It's a very good for you to be able to identify. It's good as well, we are developing what we call a patient passport, uh, where we show uh, how the person should be positioned. So that's important that, you know, the caregivers, the family know, this is how I want them seated. So we want to take a before photograph and an after photograph. We always identify, does the posture have flexible or fixed components? Have we identified the cause of the problem, not just the symptom? Have we looked at the skin and have we maximised the imprint of sitting for function, for skin and for comfort? Because we want to have the person in this chair for as long as possible. We all know the benefits of sitting up as opposed to being in bed. So the person is only going to stay in the chair for an extended period of time if we have managed to improve their function, their, uh, looked after their skin and improved their comfort. Now, I've been asked in lots of times uh, in the questions to cover the basic seating assessment or what we like to call critical measures. And I have to give credit for this to Ulster University because I did a postgraduate module there and this is where I learned this. And I'm delighted to be able to share it with you because th this is what we would call the basic seating assessment. And if you can do these essential measurements or these critical measures, you are making such a difference to your patient. And the first one that we're looking at is hip flexion. Now, hip flexion 
influences the position of the pelvis. Uh, if it's correctly, if it's incorrect, it can cause tilt and obliquity. So for not accommodating hip flexion, we can cause the pelvis to sit in a posterior pelvic tilt and an obliquity. You need to assess hip flexion bilaterally. And it's the key to setting the angle of the back, i.e. the amount of recline required. So the first one is hip flexion. And again, we want to feel the ASIS, keep the thumb on the ASIS, and I want to see how much hip flexion I can achieve with the client without causing resistance. If I overflex the hip, I will notice the ASIS will start to rotate. So overflexing the hip causes hip rotation. So I'm just going to demonstrate how you would use a goniometer to measure the hip angle. Now this is not always essential. With practice and with experience, you can actually gauge the angle of the hip. But if you feel you want to use a goniometer, I'll just demonstrate that. So the goniometer has a fixed leg and a movable leg. So the fixed leg will sit along the surface of the mattress or the seat, the, the surface. And we're going to have the pivot right here at the pivot of the joint. And Louise is sitting here at a nice relaxed angle. So I'm going to measure that angle. So I'm going to bring the leg of the goniometer down and I see that Louise is sitting there about 125 degrees. So that there is a comfortable position for Louise. It's not putting her under any pressure or resistance and it's a fixed angle. So if that's her fixed angle, I want to ensure that the angle of the seat and the back matches the angle of her hip. So now I just want to demonstrate how you would set the back angle of the chair. Now you can see here that at the moment the chair is sitting at 90 degrees. So we need to set it to 125 to match the hip angle. So I'm going to move the back angle of the chair back. Now we have the back angle of the chair sitting at 125. And what I would do in this instance, I would fix the angle at that point because I don't want somebody coming along later and moving the angle up. So at that point, I would fix the angle of the back to match the hip angle. So the second one here is knee extension with the hips flexed. And this we've talked about a few times is testing the hamstring range. It influences the position of the pelvis. And if you don't accommodate the hamstrings, you're going to cause tilt and possibly rotation of the pelvis. Again, you need to assess it bilaterally. Accommodation of hamstrings is vital, and I did a full, set, a full video on this. And it's the key to setting the angle of the calf pad and foot plate. Is knee flexion and extension. So here what we're doing is we're testing the hamstring range. We've already assessed the hip, so you always test the hamstring range with the hip flexed. So I'm going to hold the ASIS again. I'm going to keep my thumb on there and I want to see how much extension I can get at the knee without causing resistance. And then I'm going to measure this angle here because this angle here is the angle that I'm going to set the calf pad and the foot plate at. So as you can see here from the goniometer, I have the fixed angle along here. This is the moving part. So this is where I want to find out what the range is. And you can see here that I have achieved 125 degrees. So if we bring this back down, that would be setting the foot plate at 90. And then if we can't achieve 90, we want to see where the calf pad is going to sit. It may well be that the person has very tight hamstrings and we just lower, and we may, may, we may only achieve 80 degrees. So here we are going to assess what degree we can get in hamstring range, and this is where we will set the angle of the foot plate and the calf pad. Now, when we assess Louise in the bed, we were able to achieve 125 degrees of knee flexion. So I'm going to demonstrate how the chair needs to be set in order to achieve that. Bring it right up. And as you can see, that is the angle that we were able to achieve when we assessed Louise in the bed. So it's essential that the angle of the calf pad and the foot plate match the angle of the knee and accommodates the hamstrings. I used the goniometer today just to demonstrate the angles and to show you what I meant by angles. 
but it's not essential to use a goniometer. With experience and with practice, you'll be able to gauge the angles of the back and the footrest angles without the use of a goniometer. Our third critical measure is hip adduction and abduction. It influences the position of the pelvis because by not accommodating it, we can cause the pelvis to rotate. Ensure accommodation of any restriction as this will have severe implications for preventing destructive postural tendencies. So number three, hip adduction and abduction. abduction. Now, again, you need to measure both sides. I'm going to demonstrate here on the right, but you always measure both sides. So this is the midline position that we're able to achieve. And I want to see if we can achieve abduction of the hip. Is it fixed in abduction? or is it flexible? Or is the hip in adduction? And again, is it fixed in adduction or is it flexible? Because this is going to influence a number of things. One in particular would be the width of the chair. Because if I've got a hip that's sitting in abduction and it's fixed in that position, I need to accommodate it within the width of the chair. If we have a fixed uh, abduction of the hip and we don't accommodate it, we will encourage the pelvis to sit in rotation while we have the person in the chair. So I want to demonstrate here the importance of seat width for accommodating someone with an fixed abducted hip. So we're starting off here with the width of the chair is accommodating the hip here. And we have got the width of hand on every side. But if the hip is abducted and it's fixed, we need to move the width of the chair out to allow for the abducted hip. If we try to force a fixed abducted hip, we will actually rotate the pelvis. So it's essential that if you've got a fixed abduction of the hip, that the width of the chair accommodates it. A nice feature of this particular chair, which is the Milano, is that you can actually move the top part of the chair, the arm in, and the, this part out. So what we're getting here is we're getting nice support at the pelvis, but we're still allowing for the abductive hip to sit, um, to accommodate the abductive hip. So we've discussed abduction, but what I want to point out, if you've got someone whose knees are adducting, which means they're coming in together, you may well use a pommel. But I can't stress enough how important it is that pommels are assessed individually for the patient. So I'm going to take this pommel out, and I'm going to demonstrate that if uh, the client is sitting in a windswept deformity and is fixed, and their knees are adducted. I may well put a, a pommel in here, which will be three quarters of the way over the chair. And historically, pommels are, are seen to be located centrally, which is right in here. But if I try to correct that posture and it fix, I'm going to cause a deviated posture. So number four of our critical measures is the cervical flexion and extension because it's the important for field, visual field. It's also the key position for feeding. And limitation in flexion can result in tilt being contraindicated. So if you have a client who is unable to flex the neck, you might not want to add tilt to that. So that's why it's important that the cervical flexion and extension is one of our critical measures. Now flexion may well be fixed flexion or flexible. So fixed flexion would be where the head is held forward in this position. And what we want to do is we want to accommodate that by bringing the headrest forward on the chair and then by using tilt and space in order to improve the line of vision and to improve their feeding. If this cervical flexion is flexible, the use of tilt and space is one way that we would use to help put the center of gravity behind and allow the person to lean back like that we might also want to open up the back angle of the chair. We then want to look at hyperextension, and that is where the head is held backwards. Now again, if this is something, if it's hyperextending, you may need to move the headrest back to accommodate it, or maybe if it's flexible, you could move the headrest forward to correct that posture. One thing to remember, that if you have someone who is hyperextending, and it's a fixed posture, you want to eliminate too much tilt on the chair. Because I'll just demonstrate that to you. If someone is hyperextending a lot and is fixed, and then we tilt the person as well, we can affect their 
uh, their airways and their swallow and their field of vision. So we might want to limit the amount of tilt that you would have on a chair when someone is hyperextended. So what's the takeaway? And the takeaway is you need to ensure that you have established is the posture fixed? Is it partially correctable or is it fully correctable? You accommodate a fixed posture and you try to correct a flexible posture. You never try to correct a fixed posture. So I know that I have had lots and lots of questions about the assessment process and I know it's something we're going to come back to over and over again. So thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions or comments, please do submit them below and we'll try to answer those as quickly as possible. At Seating Matters, we are here to help you and your patients. So if you have a patient that you feel would benefit from what you learned today, you can set up a person-to-person -person demonstration or an online demonstration to view our products and put this into practice.